Every one of us has been or will one day be a hospital patient. Now, what do we expect from hospitals? We expect them to leave patients in a better shape than when admitted. Unfortunately, this is not always the case. As Oscar Wilde would say, the simple truth is the, the sorry, the the pure and simple truth is, in reality, not always simple and never true. Today's healthcare is highly complex. Care is given is frequently given in a high speed and under circumstances that makes things go wrong. Things can and actually do go wrong. Patients can be harmed during healthcare delivery and the results can be tragic. Hospital infections kill 16 million patients every year. More than eight malaria and tuberculosis combined. In the United States only, hospital infections kill 200,000 people every year. The equivalent of a 747 airliner crashing every day or a death every three minutes. In the developed world, hospital infections is the second largest cause of mortality. And in the developing world, the risk is up to 20 times higher. Importantly, however, no hospital, no country, no healthcare system in the world can claim to have changed the problem today. But the good news is that there is a cure, a simple cure. Let's travel back to Vienna in the middle of the 19th century. At the time, hospital delivery was the equivalent of a death sentence for women in labor. Up to 40% of mothers were dying after giving birth. The disease, the disease was believed to be caused by poison air in the wards. But one man didn't accept this belief and studied the process. On May 15, 1847, Ignaz Philipp Semmelweis, a Hungarian obstetrician, mandated doctors and medical students to clean their hands in chlorine right before touching every woman. Maternal mortality dropped tenfold. Semmelweis had demonstrated that healthcare hands can be lethal. Hand hygiene could cure poison air in the world. Semmelweis provided the evidence to the medical community in Vienna, but his colleagues couldn't change their behavior. Semmelweis was ostracized and fired from his job. He moved to Budapest, did the same observation, the same intervention again, and maternal mortality drastically reduced. But he lost his job one again, once again, and actually spent the rest of his life in a psychiatric hospital. A broken man. Today, the virtue of hand hygiene is universally accepted worldwide. But compliance rates among hospital staff remained extremely low. Why? Why is it so difficult for healthcare workers to clean their hands when needed? This is what my team and I uh, wanted to understand several years ago. 
In December of 1994, in our university hospital in Geneva, we visited all patient rooms and monitored hand hygiene practices at the point of care. And guess what we found? If you count all the, occasion, all the occasions one nurse would have to wash her hands, considering that washing hands with soap and water will take between one and two minutes, she would need at least 30 minutes every working hours to wash her hands, which is totally impossible. In other words, nurses and doctors had no chance to clean their hands appropriately. So we needed a solution. We needed a substance that was fast-acting, did not irritate hands when applied repetitively, and could be made available all over the hospital at the point of patient care. To make a long story short, this substance is alcohol. In the name of alcohol-based hand rubs or alcohol-based hand gels. Thus, we actually gave an alcohol-based hand rub pocket bottle to each of our healthcare staff in the hospital. But that alone was not enough. Behaviors needed to change. And as we all know, it is extremely difficult to change behaviors, right? Uh, let me take an example. Uh, having seat belts in a car doesn't make you use them, right? It's a series of interventions that make, makes us buckle up. Awareness raising, strict police controls, getting tickets for some of us, etc., etc., over a long period of time. This is what you call a multimodal behavior change strategy. And this is actually exactly what we did at our institution, starting in 1995. We made alcohol available at the point of care everywhere in the hospital. We actually used the walls of the hospital to have posters reminding the importance of, of cleaning hands, and the posters were changed weekly in order to remind staff and surprise staff. We monitor hand hygiene compliance and feedback their performance to the healthcare workers. Over a three-year period, Infections were reduced by 50%, avoiding a large number of deaths. Financially, this meant a savings of more than $20 million per year for our university hospitals, a 2,400-bed hospital. In 2000, we published our results in the Lancet. In 2002, the UK converted to the so-called Geneva promotion model. In 2005, the World Health Organization got involved. Today, the campaign runs in 171 countries, covering more than 95% of the world population, saving lives in hospitals all over the world, from modern healthcare settings to settings with very limited resources, in a very multicultural environment, and actually ensuring universal system change. But that, of course, didn't happen easy. Changing behavior is actually always facing resistance. Let me give you a few examples. Because alcohol is flammable, U.S. fire marshals were opposed to the wide distribution of alcohol-based hand rub in hospitals in the United States, arguing that it may increase fire hazards. It took us two more years to run the campaign in the U.S. Even worse, nurses' unions in the United States again Fearing that alcohol could damage nail polish, <laughs> refused in the beginning to adopt our strategy of removing false nails 
that are proven reservoirs of bacteria and sources of multiple outbreaks of hospital infections. In the Muslim world, some Muslim healthcare workers were reluctant to apply alcohol on their hands, afraid by the possibility of skin absorption of a substance prohibited by the Koran. Actually, in the UK, a young Muslim nurse rubbing hands at work was evicted from home by her father. We had to work with the Muslim clergy and Muslim scholars in Saudi Arabia, and today, the use of alcohol-based hand rub during patient care has been approved by the Muslim League and is widely used in Muslim countries. Beliefs, attitudes, and fear are the universal enemies of behavioral change. And so is greed. I once visited a remote hospital in rural Kenya. There was a nurse in a surgical ward rubbing her hands with an alcohol-based hand rub kept in a locked wooden box. I was surprised and I asked, why such a lock? Until I discovered that this very modest hospital was paying twice more the price you or I would pay for the same product in Boston or in Geneva. That was too much. That was our motivation to create a local produced alcohol-based hand rub. So-called today, the WHO alcohol-based hand rub formulation. And here is my friend, Lozemi Bengali, in his very modest pharmacy in Mali, Africa, preparing this low-cost alcohol-based hand rub out of sugarcane by product. Today, alcohol is produced at low cost in many countries around the world out of sugarcane, manioc, uh, walnut, potatoes, to cite only a few, at very, very, very low cost. So local production is feasible and cheap. It took over 150 years to recognize Semmelweis's genius. It is still a struggle to promote universal hand hygiene in hospital. As Margaret Heffernan once said in a TED talk, openness alone can't drive change. One must dare to disagree. My message to you, if you got access to a hospital tomorrow, please make sure of two things. First, that the hospital would be part of the WHO worldwide hand hygiene campaign. And second, that Nurses and doctors would clean their hands right before they are taking care of you, your friends, or your family. If not, please remind them. Remember, clean hands save lives. It's in your hands. Thank you very much.